You're listening to Let's Talk Creation with Todd Wood and Paul Garner, the creation show where we learn, grow, and worship. Well, welcome back again to another episode of Let's Talk Creation with Paul Garner and Todd Wood. I'm Paul Garner. And I am Todd Wood. Uh, Don't forget to like and share our episodes uh, and uh, hit that subscribe button so that you get all of our content in the future and uh, check out our social media. We're on Facebook and Twitter and uh, and we've got a a brand new website. Well, I say brand new. It's been up a few weeks now, but um, if you haven't checked out our website, go and take a look. It's letstalkcreation.org. So do go and check that out because you'll find all of our past episodes there and our uh, show notes. So uh, it's a great resource. Todd, today um, we've got another episode in one of our occasional series that we've got running, uh, and this time we're coming back to the topic of uh, natural evil. Right. Uh, we've done a few past episodes on this already, so we, we did a, a kind of an introductory episode where we looked at the problem of evil, and we looked at it from a number of different perspectives. So we looked at biblical uh, issues and we looked at philosophical questions and some scientific questions uh, and then we had a couple of episodes where we had uh, some guests we had dr joe francis who came to talk to us about microbes and disease and all of those sorts of topics and then we had dr jeremy blashkey who <laughs> talked to us about parasites that was and... a memorable episode wasn't it <laughs> <laughs> it was ticks and tapeworms yes. and mm. stuff like that so so we've already kind of touched on on some of these topics and and the basic question that we've really been trying to address in this series is why do bad things happen in a good creation because the bible tells us that god when he created the world declared it to be very good uh, but we have all of this bad stuff in, in the world. And so we're just sort of exploring how that fits in into the, the creationist, uh, biblical creationist worldview. Now, today, we're not really going to be talking about all that sort of gross stuff um, that we were talking about with Jeremy. Um, we want to talk about design. Uh, and particularly, we're, we're going to think about um, structures in the creation, creatures that appear well-designed, beautifully designed, but appear to be designed to harm or to kill or to destroy. So that's really the topic we want to dig into a bit more today. And when we think about the whole question of uh, design, I guess many of our viewers and listeners are going to think about what's become known as the intelligent design movement, um, the ID movement. Uh, Now, we haven't really talked very much about the intelligent design movement here on the podcast um, so far, and perhaps we'll come back to that in future episodes. But one of the things that the ID guys have done is they've given a lot of serious thought to this question of design, and in particular, how we recognize, how we identify uh, designed uh, things in in the creation, whether they're non-biological or biological things. And... Uh, they've proposed a number of methods that scientists can use to recognize design in the creation. And uh, one of the ideas that they've proposed uh, is that we can recognize design by distinguishing between low probability events, the kinds of things that just happen all the time, that are just kind of random, and low probability events which are unexpected, uh, which have some kind of specification. Right. And they've argued that that allows us to distinguish just sort of natural processes from things that are designed. Uh, and so our viewers and listeners may be familiar, for example, with the example uh, of the bacterial flagellum. Uh, uh, Michael Behe, who's a biochemist in the ID movement, he wrote a book some years ago called Darwin's Black Box, and I think it was one of the examples that he used there, uh, where you've got this um, this molecular structure, proteins, various components that make up this thing called the bacterial flagellum. It's got all of these different working parts that sort of function together, 
with a particular sort of uh, function in mind, which is propulsion. So this yeah. thing helps the bacteri bacterial cells sort of move around. And uh, Bill Dembski, who's another one of the ID guys, he's talked about this concept of specified complexity. So complexity that's oriented to a particular purpose or a particular predicted outcome. Yeah. So, uh, so we have this idea that there's complexity, but it's complexity that is functional that ha that has a purpose that that so you can you can infer that there was design behind this complexity behind this design so before we kind of get into the details of uh, of today's episode because what what we want to do is we want to look at objects that sh that display those kinds of traits those kinds of characteristics from which we can infer design but which appear to be designed to do nasty things yes. Uh, yes. to harm or to kill. That's basically <laughs> where we're going to go with this. Um, but before we sort of get down into the details of that, Todd, I, I used a phrase earlier um, where I talked about natural evil, because I think we're familiar, aren't we, oh, yeah. to think about this problem, the problem of evil. It's one of those great problems in uh, so that you come across if you if you listen to any Christian apologetics or you know if you uh, you look at the philosophy of religion you come across this idea of the problem of evil, but we're talking specifically about the problem of natural evil. Yeah. So perhaps we should begin there. What do we mean when we talk about the problem of natural evil? That is that is such a difficult question. I think to answer. Um, because it's, on the one hand, I have creationist friends and colleagues who are kind of uncomfortable with the idea, with, with the term natural evil, let's say that. Um, they don't like the idea that God makes things that are evil, because God, does, God is not the author of evil. Um, so, yeah, I get that. I've tried other words in my in my book I wrote 20 years ago. I used the term imperfection. Um as if this yes, book. that's the book. Understanding the pattern of life. That's the book. Understanding <laughs> the, the book. pattern of life. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and I I use the term biological imperfection and I don't know that I'm happy with that one either. It's it's a it's a tricky thing to define. Um so let's let's take an example here. One of the one of the problems that we come to is this issue that we have um, different aspects of God's creation that are clearly designed for certain things, but that if you use them the wrong way, they can be terrible, terrible things. Right. So a hammer used to build a house is a good thing. A hammer used to murder someone, that's a terrible thing, right? We don't call the hammer evil, necessarily. That would be weird. Um, and the same, I think, goes for creation. Water, right? If you don't get enough water in a day, you're going to get dehydrated. And if you stop drinking it altogether, you will die. Um, but if you inhale it, <laughs> it will kill you. Right? So if you use it the wrong way, it's going to kill you. I don't call water evil because of that. Um, on the other hand, uh, bears, I think bears are a really interesting example of this, where you have bears that will just, you know, eat whatever. They will eat berries, they will eat fruit, they will eat honey. Uh, but they will also uh, hunt and kill things. Now. If we think that the original creation was without death and suffering, and that that applied to some of the animals as well, which I, we, I believe, and creationists believe this, then you have to look at this, this, this behavior of the bear and think, okay, well, that's, that's clearly deviated from God's original plan. That was, it may be God's good design for the creation now, but that wasn't the original intention for the bear. I wouldn't call the bear evil, but I would say that something has gone wrong here. There's some aspect of evil that has, that has corrupted um, the creation. So, yeah, so 
So this episode, this was kind of my brainstorm. This is kind of my pet idea here. Uh, I thought it would be really interesting to go through these, these issues of design as they apply to natural evil. Because, you know, when I, when I first encountered the design movement in the 90s as a student, um, as a graduate student, I, I was really intrigued by it. But I was also really intrigued by the reality that, you know, if you applied this to a virus, for example, you'd have to say the virus was clearly designed. <laughs> and I thought, well, that, that's not good, <laughs> right? Um, and, and it's been something that I've been thinking about for years and really trying to ponder as I tease apart, okay, well, if things that cause death and suffering in creation aren't part of the original creation, then how do we, how should we understand them? And the longer I've pondered yep. this, the more I've come to this, this, this place where I've decided, okay, well, God's design is in what we think of as natural evil as well. So we need a better understanding, I think, of how, mm. of how the fall took place and the curse on creation was implemented. And we'll, but we'll get to that. Yeah. Let's get some, some examples, yeah. maybe. Yeah, no, that, that, that's very helpful. So really the kind of question, and to take up your example there of the bears, um, you're really wanting to know what were bears like before the fall? Yeah. If, if they weren't kind of hunting prey and killing yeah. things, you know, what, what, what were these bears like? Were, were, they, were they basically identical to modern bears, but they just had a dietary change? Mm -hmm. uh, or were there other differences maybe physical differences you know right. may, maybe so they maybe looked a bit different than bears today right. um and that's quite a difficult question to answer because we don't have direct access to those originally created bears we we right we can't um observe them so we we don't really know what what yeah. they were like we have to we have to infer things and they look, and of course they look so uh they look so cute and jolly on on the nature <laughs> programs right when you see them frolicking, yeah. frolicking in the streams and the little baby bear yeah. cubs running around, they look so great and we, we love them. Yeah. And then, you know, you, you get on the bad side of a grumpy grizzly and it will kill you. Right. Just yeah. that simple. And it does. The grizzlies kill people every year. Oh, so, oh yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Something I've seen some pretty, I've, I've seen some pretty scary, um, videos on on the internet oh, yeah, bears yeah. and human encounters mm -hmm. with bears yeah they yeah. can be pretty ferocious yeah, yeah. so um, yeah yeah so how so are bears different today and and if if they are different today from how they were when they were originally created how did that actually play out you know what what, what yeah. happened um right you know th this is another interesting question did was there some kind of moment when god um redesigned animals was there some kind of miraculous event where god sort of restructures the creation uh or were these animals perhaps carrying latent hidden genetic information right that would only later be expressed in in terms of you know claws and sharp teeth and all, all of these kinds of things and and modifications to behavior um and that, yeah, that that opens up a whole load of really intriguing um, questions. And of course, it's even more complex than that because there are certain structures that you see in animals like bears, which today are used, say, for carnivory, for meat eating, right? But which can have benign purposes. Sure. Uh, so sharp claws can be used to dig or mm -hmm. to climb. They don't have to be used to necessarily to to kill you know prey animals right or to hunt fish or, or whatever right, yeah. what, whatever it is um so you know how did these how did these changes come about if if they have changed what was it was it all of a sudden in a flash at the time of the fall mm. uh did, did these things sort of ex, ex become expressed over some period of time after the fall uh and so anyway we, we these are the kinds of things we just wanted to sort of begin to explore, at least in in this episode. This intersection uh, in the realm of biology between things on the one hand that look exquisitely designed, but on the other hand, things that appear designed to harm or kill or destroy. So that's that's kind of where we're going. And um, 
maybe, uh, you know, as we think about where to take this discussion from here, maybe we should start to think about another hmm. example. And I think you've got one particular example in mind. Yeah. That is a, is a fantastic example of exactly the thing that we're, right. we're trying to talk right, about right. here. Because with bears, we've seen enough nature programs, we can imagine them being jolly and happy one moment, and then maybe, you know, Adam and Eve eat the fruit, and now they're grumpy and irritable um, and dangerous. Uh, that, that maybe is not so hard to imagine. And, you know, we see them eating fruit and stuff like that. So, you know, it's not impossible to think, oh, you know, it's a simple, it's a simple switch of attitude and behavior in the bear. That's not the case, I think, with something like um, pit vipers. Uh, so a pit viper, this is, this is a snake, right? And these, these snakes, uh, my goodness, there's, there's a number of species. Rattlesnakes would be an example. Um, and there's a bunch of different species of rattlesnake for that matter. Um, these are snakes that have just this exquisite ability and physical apparatus for hunting and immobilizing and consuming their prey. Snakes, these snakes are all carnivores. They do not, they're not jolly. They do not eat fruit. <laughs> they do not frolic in the stream like the bears do. There's nothing frolicsome about them. When you see them, you're creeped out and you're freaked out. And unless you're a snake person, in which case you think they're cool, but keep your distance. Um, yeah, snakes, especially the pit vipers, these are the ones that I think are, they, they pose a remarkably difficult challenge to understanding um, exactly how this, this, this natural evil, this biological imperfection was implemented in creation. So let's just run this down a little bit. So pit vipers are named pit vipers because of the pit organ, which sits uh, between the eye and the nostril. This is, you know, if you see a snake and uh, you're wondering, is it a pit viper or not? Well, look for that little opening. And some of you, I think, are thinking, I don't want to stick around long enough to look for that little <laughs> opening between its eye I and just, its I, I was just thinking that. I, I was thinking, I'm not going to get close enough to see that. <laughs> I have encountered um, I have encountered vipers in the woods here, They're not very frequently, um, and I've never encountered any of them here on my own private property. Um, but I've encountered them in parks and on hikes, and generally speaking, they're pretty chill as long as you just maintain a respectful distance. <laughs> that's that's the key, respectful distance. And I would also say, you know, for those of you in regions where these snakes live, you're more likely to see a, a harmless snake than you are a, a pit viper, unless you're in certain areas where they're very common. But for the most part, you know, people send me pictures of snakes at, that they've killed. And I said, well, that was a rat snake. That was a black snake. That was a king snake. You should have let that one live because they will eat vermin. But anyway. Um, yeah, so they got this pit organ, this opening, this extra opening on the side of their face between their nostril and their eyeball. And that pit organ senses heat. It's a heat sensor, right? So even in the dark, these snakes can detect heat sources around them. Which by itself is pretty neat, I think. Um, I don't know that we should be all that shocked by it. The, the idea that we have eyes that can see things, visible light, and noses that can smell so many different molecules and sense the differences between different molecules. Taste buds that are able to distinguish so many different flavors together with our, with our nose to create these intense, unique flavors for so many different foods. Um, yeah, I suppose... The idea that there could be organs that sense heat shouldn't be all that shocking, but it's still, I think it's pretty neat. I think it's a remarkable yeah. organ. And when you think about sense organs and the complexity of sense organs to be able to interact with the environment, transmit that information or convert that information into electrical signals to send to the brain and have the brain then interpret that as something meaningful, right? Um, that's pretty sophisticated stuff. 
So the idea yeah. that this this snake would have this organ on the side of its head that would help it um, detect heat is not a that's not a random thing. That's not an accident. That's not bears going from jolly to irritable. That's something that God built into this snake somehow for some reason. It's a design. It is specified complexity, whatever you want to call it. So that's one issue. It can it can find things that it wants to eat. Then the second part is, of course, the part that everybody is concerned about, and that's the the whole venom injection part. And another uh, another thing, a little a little uh, community awareness here. Remember, poisonous is something that you eat and harms you. Venomous has to be injected into your blood in order to do the damage. So people talk about poisonous snakes. They would only be poisonous if you ate them and they hurt you. Um, <laughs> most snakes are not poisonous. Venomous snakes? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Many snakes are venomous. Um, and I should also mention, I looked this up just to make sure that I'm saying this right. You could theoretically drink snake venom and it would be okay. <laughs> I would not recommend it. And, and the big concern <laughs> that everyone had when I was reading about this, could you drink snake venom? The concern they had was if you have the least little bit of, of ulcer or cut anywhere in your digestive system, that could spell doom for you because the venom could leak into your bloodstream. Um, but as long as you keep it out of your bloodstream, as long as your digestive system is okay, yeah, you could totally drink venom, snake venom, which is nuts. We're, we're not advocating this. Do I not want to do be that. Clear. We are not advocating this. Absolutely do not do that. It is it is quite risky. Um, I don't know where yeah. you'd get a cup of venom to drink anyway. But anyway. Um, yeah. So, so you've got these snakes. They've got these fangs that are basically mobile, right? So they're, 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 they're folded back when their mouths are closed. And then they open up and curl them forward to deploy them. Which, that's pretty incredible. Um, the fangs are hollow, right? And they're attached to these glands that secrete, as we've already said, snake venom. And snake venom is basically kind of a mix, a cocktail of protein enzymes uh, that would you would normally associate them with digestion. So there are enzymes called phospholipases. And phospholipases go in and they start breaking down cell membranes. And we make phospholipases because we need to break down the sorts of uh, lipids that you would find in membranes. And this is another one of those weird things where used properly in the right context, it's no big deal. But if you get a snake version of this that's injected, it'll start tearing up your, your, your membranes, which is very bad. Um, other things, you could have proteases in these things that start breaking down different proteins. But it's, and there are many, I should also mention this, there are many different types of these enzymes that are found in the snake venom. Um, so it's a, it's, it's, it's a startling system, right? You've got the you've got the gland that's making these sort of modified digestive enzymes. They're they're modified in the sense of being sort of supercharged and souped up and extra effective at what they do. And then you have the the gland has this this tube that goes to the tooth. The tooth is hollow. It looks works like a hypodermic needle. It deploys, so the snake isn't, isn't injecting venom into itself. It only deploys when the snake's ready to, to pounce. Usually, these things are used on small creatures, vermin, for example. Um, and it's not used necessarily to uh, kill as much as it is used to immobilize. So, the idea would be the snake comes out, the snake is, you know, hunting with its pit, organ, it finds a nice juicy squirrel that it wants to eat. Boom, it pounces. 
uh, injects the venom into the squirrel. The squirrel is based, you know, give the squirrel a couple of seconds and it'll be just laying there limp. Now the snake can eat the squirrel without the squirrel fighting back. Really handy. Um, if, if you're, if you're a snake, right, if you're a snake out hunting (laughs) and of course, then you have the whole situation of, you know, snakes can be irritable and you get near this venomous snake and it can reach out and bite you. And they don't always kill snake bites aren't always fatal, but enough of them are fatal. And usually to young children, which are the ones who aren't, you know, experienced enough and smart enough to know not to play with that creature. Uh, yeah, you can, you can, it can kill you. So it's a remarkable system. It's beautifully designed and it's just terrible. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not so great if you're a squirrel. That's that's for sure. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so yeah, so we've got these incredible designs and it is very hard to imagine when you look at us, you know, this incredible sort of integrated system that you've just described that there is any benign use for this you know it's it's very hard to think you know we we talked earlier about the the bears and you know you can use claws to dig and to climb trees it is very difficult to think of a benign use for this venom injection system that right the, <laughs> the, the the vipers have so uh so yeah it's it's complex it's well designed but it's designed to do something pretty nasty. Yeah. Uh, so if these things are designed, then Todd, I mean, what, what are we saying here? Are we saying that they therefore had to be part of the original creation that God made? I mean, w- would Adam and Eve, if they were walking around in the garden, would they have had to beware of pit vipers in, in the garden in case they got, you know, bitten by one of these things? I, you know, I, it's, it's super difficult to imagine that. But I think this is really where um, the sort of biology in creationism becomes really important. <laughs> and if it sounds like we're struggling to articulate these ideas in this episode as we go along, it's because we're struggling to articulate these ideas. <laughs> right. Um, because I don't want to say God made rattlesnakes to kill people. But then on the other hand, you look in the Old Testament and you do find, you, you remember the, the time in the, in the wandering in the wilderness when Israel was complaining again and God sent fiery serpents into the camp to bite and kill them. So, huh, all right, well, yeah. Uh, hmm. Certain occasions God can use these things to do those kinds of that kind of punishment he he uses them on purpose with their venom intact to do to accomplish his purposes um but again though we where i think we we struggle is this notion that god's original creation was very good we see the 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 imagery in the prophets in the old testament of the future coming kingdom um when children will be able to to interact with these uh, venomous serpents and not become harmed. Um, That's the imagery that's used to describe the peace of the coming kingdom of God. And so, how do you you make sense of this then from a design perspective, right? So I can imagine lots of things. Like I've said with the bears, I can imagine the jolly bear turns into a grumpy, mean thing that kills stuff. I can imagine that relatively easily. Um, I can imagine other things. We talked with Joe Francis about various microbes. We talked, one of the examples we gave there was anthrax. So I'm not going to go through the whole example. Look up that episode. We'll include it in the show notes. Um, But there we have an example where anthrax is essentially a soil bacterium that gets, uh, that's very good at forming these spores that can survive um, dehydration. But if you breathe them in, then they'll get into your bloodstream and kill you. Um, and again, that's one of those situations where I feel like, okay, well, there's, there's some goodness here that's been, oops, put into the wrong situation and becomes bad. But like you say, the viper? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, are we looking at 
the original creation, if you could see the originally created Pit Viper back in the day, would you have noticed all of these remarkable features? Or would you have seen something that looked like a Pit Viper but was not venomous? Um, or would you have seen no Pit Viper at all? Would there be no pits? They had no ability to hunt or, or track warm creatures. Um, I'm not sure. One thing that we do know, thinking about this from the perspective of created kind, when we look at the sort of variety of these sorts of creatures, uh, in the snakes and, and the sort of venomous snakes, we often find, and I think this is really interesting, different species have different, um, different manifestations of this sort of venomous arsenal, right? So if you think about the whole package, right, the perfect package in the pit fiber, you have the pit for a sensing heat, you've got the hollow fang that retracts, you've got the tube that leads to the venom sac and the venom, uh, the venom gland and the venom gland itself that's producing the venom. All of those things have to be there to make it really effective. But it's not, as Mike Behe would say, it's not irreducibly complex. You can have snakes that have only parts of that. There are snakes that do not have tubes running to hollow fangs. There are snakes that have fangs with grooves that run along the axis of the tooth, right? So they have these groove teeth, and then they have these glands that just secrete these enzymes into their mouth that then run along the grooves into, uh, into the wound that they're creating on the animal. So it's not directly injected so much as it is just really toxic saliva that they're creating, in a sense. Um, and these are, I think, part of the created kind, along with snakes that have the more sophisticated um, venom injection system. So so there is a variability there that makes me think, all right, well, maybe the full venom system is not necessarily the way the snake started out, but at the same time, it's an amazing design. So I can't just say, oh, it evolved or whatever, whatever it is that people think it might have happened over the history of creation. It's not an accident. It's not a genetic variation or variability or whatever. This... This system bears all the hallmarks of intelligent design. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting, isn't it? You get these kind of gradations sometimes within the created yeah. kinds where the, the whole system is not necessarily there in all of its elements. You know, you, you, you have these, these various sort of variations on a, on a theme some more well-developed than others. Yes, exactly. And that, that's, kind of, that's kind of intriguing, isn't it? Um, and I, I think sometimes we get hints, uh, in creation like this, that, uh, there may have been a different kind of economy Yeah, whatever. <laughs> in the original creation. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we get these strange hints, I think that, um, perhaps give us clues to what that original pre-fall world might have been like without right. death and, and, and suffering and so on. Um, perhaps we could just talk about some examples of, of that, because I think that would be helpful for people to think about. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we mentioned bears, um, where you have, you know, and, and it's easy to think about bears being happy-go-lucky bears. Um, I think domestic dogs... Um, would be another great example. You have the wolf, which is a dangerous pack hunter, and then you have your 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 domestic dog, which is friendly most for the most part. They there can be some aggressive ones, but for the most part they're going to be friendly and happy and well adjusted to your um your your human presence. And and again, they can go wild and do terrible things if they're not treated well or if they I don't know. Sometimes they just snap. But for the most part, they're pretty well adjusted. Cats, cats are little murderers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're great with us, but anything smaller than them, they're gonna they're gonna kill, and they kill a lot. And outdoor cats kill a lot, um, and they do it usually gratuitously. Um, so cats are cats are a little on the on the edge there of natural evil. But I think most cat owners already knew that. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I've often wondered. I've often wondered what my pet cat would do if I was the size of a mouse. Right. Would it... <laughs> I think he would. Have... I suspect. You, yeah, you'd be dead. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think the, the the whole sort of authority structure would be upturned. I think somehow. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So. So, so those are some examples that come to mind. I think there are there, there's plenty of places. And, and what I think I like about the pet example, especially, is the way that expresses our dominion over creation, right? God, mm -hmm. God created us as his image, his representatives here on earth in, in this creation. And he gave us the power to have dominion over creation, to be in charge and to exercise authority, and to be as God to creation, quite literally. That's what image is. We are, we are God's representatives here. And so when I see something like a, a sort of a dangerous carnivore, like a wolf or, or, or one of these feral cats, uh, turned into this gentle, kind little pet, I think that is, that is <laughs> exactly what dominion <laughs> should be, right? It is, it is yeah. the, the taming and the kinding and d putting grace into creation and seeing it turn, transform into something quite good. Um, so I think that's really interesting. Now, did God make things like that for us to do that with, right? For us to tame and make into a better image of the grace and kindness of God. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, that's, that's, that's another one of those hard questions, right? Um, now, the other possibility, so you, you mentioned the one possibility is this, this idea of um, going from sort of a benign state to a, to a more feral, angry, evil state, right? So the, the bear that goes from being jolly to being grumpy and is still pretty much the same bear. Um, the other possibility, of course, is that the, the fall, right, the curse on creation, was far more transformative than we have given it credit for. Um, hmm. And I think, I think there's, if I could say, you know, there's sort of a stereotype in the mind of a typical young age creationist. Maybe that stereotype is, you know, Adam's there in the garden and there's a lion and there's a tiger and there's a bear and he, they're all getting along and we're all happy and they're eating apples and whatever. <laughs> and then Eve and Adam eat the, eat the forbidden fruit. And then now lions are killers and tigers are killers and bears are killers. And, it, and, it's, and it's just a really easy change, right? Adam goes from being essentially some a, a person that would have lived on continuously for an, you know eternity maybe to uh, now a person that gets old and dies and it's a really simple it's a really simple change I I don't think that's the case you know when I think about things like pit vipers I just think no there's got to be more to the fall than just a change in attitude, a change in behavior. I don't think that really captures the full, the full heft, the full weight of what happened um, when God said, nope, you will surely die, and now it's going to happen, yeah. and here it comes. Yeah. And now creation goes from being uh, a, a, a minor challenge to manage to being somewhat impossible to manage. No longer... Hmm. Are we going to be able to, to dominate creation the same way that we would have had we not sinned? Sin disrupted that yeah. relationship. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is a, you know, as, as you begin to think about it, you realize how complex this, this question is. Yeah. And the different types of solutions, you know, may be applicable in different, in different cases. Um, there are some cases, as you say, that are simple changes in behavior or, or whatever, and there are other cases where it's much harder to explain. 
Um, and we do get these little glimpses, don't we? I, I think in my book, The New Creationism, when that came out, I, I mentioned a few examples where you get these little clues, maybe what the pre-flood world, might, uh, the pre-fall world might have been like. Yeah. Um, there are there are fossil crocodilians, for example. Um, you know, can you imagine, you know, a more archetypal ambush predator than <laughs> yeah. a crocodile? Right. But there are fossil there are fossil crocodilians um, that appear to be herbivores. They they appear to have these sort of peg like teeth that were designed for eating aquatic plants. Yeah. And sometimes you just get those little clues, don't yeah. you? That that yeah. kind of suggests the world might might have been different. Um, Todd, I think you were going to talk to us about um another example, which was intriguing. I don't know very much about yes. this. Uh, the the flu virus. Yes, this this is fun. This is what this is one of my personal stories. So gather around, children. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a great story here. <laughs> I I learned about this in grad school in in my biochemistry class. Um, and it was one of those one of those you know pivotal moments for me as I realized, wow. Um, the fall has to be more than just, you know, a simple alteration. So, so to understand this, I, I we I kind of have to explain to you about the way your mucous membranes work. So, lining your body, the on the inside of your body are various mucous membranes. There are cells that line these these membranes, and these cells um, secrete stuff slime mostly that then traps stuff that shouldn't be there or that should be there and then there are other cells that can then consume gunk so the way that happens it's called endocytosis or phagocytosis either one um and the way it goes about is that you you know the cell is sitting there and this particle comes and lands on the surface and the cell if i may be uh, permitted a bit of anthropomorphism the cell says hey this looks good i'm going to eat it so it starts to assemble on the inside uh, on the underside of the membrane it sort of starts to assemble this molecular um it's really cool it's a molecular scaffold that basically forms this dome and then eventually forms an entire circle. What's, what it's doing is creating a little pit on the surface and then drawing that in. So now the particle is inside of this little sack. And then eventually it pinches off from the cell's membrane, surf, surface membrane. And now it is inside of the cell, inside of this little membrane, this little membrane brown sack, and the little whatever it is the food particle or the foreign particle is inside of that inside of that sack what happens next <laughs> uh the cell then will there's a couple of things that can happen but one of the things that will, that might happen is that the cell will begin to acidify the interior of that of that pouch right or it might merge with another acidic pouch like a a thing called a lysozyme basically what's going on there is that uh the cell is pumping protons into that um into that pouch into that sac called an endosome and that makes it more acidic and the acid of course is intended to break stuff down we all know that we've all seen tv where acid burns things that that's basically what's going on you use acid in your stomach to digest food and so do cells. They create these little endosomes, which are like little cellular stomachs, and then they use acid then to start breaking it down. And then eventually, you know, the, the, when the particle is fully digested, the, the, uh, the endosome itself can break down, or it can be used, it can be repurposed for other things. Okay, so, so that's the normal happy thing. And as the particle inside of this little pouch breaks down, and there are other proteins on the surface that'll use, export all the parts and reuse them for what the cell needs. Okay, so that's the, that's the normal way of doing things, a normal, healthy uh, way. Now, the flu virus has a, <laughs> a way of utilizing this system to wreak havoc 
on your your body and wreak havoc on your cells. So if you know anything about viruses, viruses are not alive in the same sense as a cell is alive. A cell carries out metabolism, it can eat things, it can drink things, it can move around, usually it has some kind of motion. Um, it responds to things in the environment. A virus is basically just a piece of genetic information with a couple of enzymes. And the enzymes are used to sort of hijack, uh, gain access to the cell, hijack the cell, and trick the cell into making copies of the virus. It's exactly like a computer virus. That's why we use the term virus to describe computer viruses, that the purpose of which is merely to make copies of themselves and sort of wreak havoc on your computer when you get one. Okay, so how does this work? Well, the, the influenza virus has on its surface a protein called hemagglutinin. Uh, and hemagglutinin will, uh, this, this hemagglutinin, <laughs> this is a remarkable structure. The hemagglutinin sort of, it, it attaches to the cell, right? It attaches to your cell. Um, and then as the uh, endosome forms, right, the cell is thinking, if I may anthropomorphize, I'm going to digest this particle that has landed on my surface. And so it makes the, makes the, the pit and then it pinches it off and makes a little pouch on the inside of the cell. And it starts making that pouch acidic right, in order to digest it like it normally would with particles that land on its surface. The tricky bit is, the, is this hemagglutinin. So actually, <clears throat> under, normal, uh, under normal pH in your body, your, say your blood or your, or your normal pH of your mucus lining, um, the flu virus will... Uh, the hemagglutinin on the flu virus will have a particular sort of coiled up um, shape to it, right? And as it becomes acidic, it changes shape. And that's, that's the ingenious part. And it changes shape not just, not just randomly. It turns into a little harpoon. So it, it, it literally shoots out this part into the membrane of the endosome. And it attaches to that membrane and draws the particle of the flu virus close to the membrane. And it does it so well that it literally breaks open the, the endosome and lets the flu genetic material into the cell. So it, <laughs> it is literally hijacked this acidifying uh, behavior of your cells in order to make possible the replication of this virus. So before the, the, the pouch gets too acidic and actually does break down the, the flu, it, it breaks through out and, and releases the contents of the, of the virus into your cell. Surprise! Oopsie! And then your cell is, is hijacked and begins to make more flu viruses and so forth. And this goes on until basically your, your immune system says, well, I've had enough of this flu virus stuff. We need to get this stuff out of here. And then starts producing the, the antibodies and such that, that are necessary in order to control the flu virus. Um, the hemagglutinin then, if you've ever heard people talking about the various flu types, right? H1N1, the H there stands for hemagglutinin. The N is neuraminidase. It's another enzyme um, that's involved in, in uh, the, the flu virus. Um, but the different types of hemagglutinin get different numbers, and the different types of neur neuraminidases get different numbers. So you have this H1N1 or H3N5 or whatever, these different combos of, of flu that, that are used to describe the different flu, um, the different flu strains that, that hit. And it's all this, this reminds it's just a remarkable little Trojan horse, right? Classic Trojan <laughs> horse where the cell is thinking, hey, this looks good to eat. I'll eat this. Brings it in and then too late discovers, oops, it was full of this nasty stuff that is now, that is now you know, tearing up the cell 
and it's producing all this stupid virus, and I don't want this stupid virus, but here it is, and it, it's a mess. And, and as I sat there in my lecture hall in the, my biochemistry class, and I'm sitting here listening to this, this professor describe this system, I'm just completely in awe, thinking this is such elegant design. And that's something that, that happens so often in biology. We just think this is such an elegant design, but it's <laughs> such a, a terrible thing that it's doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so yeah. beautiful and brilliant and awful all at the same time. <laughs> all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I guess, you know, the, the, the question that I'm sort of struggling with here is, you know, what, what does this tell us then about the creator? Um, and I think when you, when you begin to read the intelligent design literature, I think the response, uh, you know, when, when these kinds of examples come up is to say, well, it doesn't really matter, at least in terms of the inference to, de to design, um, because, you know, whatever these things are designed to do, they're still designed, right? right? So <laughs> you can't get around the inference to design, right? Um, you know, which is, yeah, I mean, fair enough. But I think as creationists, uh, we find that sort of deeply unsatisfying yes! <laughs> because we, we don't want to just infer any old designer. Right. <laughs> we think there's a particular designer behind the world, and that's the good God of the Bible. Right. Uh, and so, you know, we can't dodge this question, perhaps, in, in, in that way. Um, you know, we, we, we want to understand how these things fit into that bigger overall biblical story. Uh, so if there are designs that appear to be entirely designed for harm, then what on earth do we do with them? And so I guess that's, yeah, that's, that's the, the big, big question, sort of, right? that's, that's what leaves me scratching my head. Right. 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 And I think, I think, you know, as we think about this, I've sort of, We've sort of been talking about this all along, this idea that, that the fall and the curse on creation is not simply a, my, a modest change, right? It's not a simple thing where there was a creation and God just added some death to it, where you go from jolly bears to grumpy bears. Um, that to facilitate the full extent of the curse that that god that god really changed what he what he made from one one form to another how he did that i don't know i'm not i'm not going to we're not going to speculate on that today but but i think the change is inevitable and i think about this um especially in terms of what paul tells us in uh the book of the book of Romans here. Um, this is Romans eight, uh, eighteen through twenty two. Paul says, "For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the, reve the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility." not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And I just think about that a lot. You know, this notion that that God subjected the world. He did this on purpose. This was not an accident. This was not merely just a little bit of a, you know, he didn't just sprinkle some death on top of what he'd already made. This is, this is something quite different. And Paul likens it here to the pains of childbirth. That, there, that this, this suffering that we're enduring, the suffering that creation endures as it groans, is not the way God intended it, and it's not permanent. It's not a permanent state. It is intending to lead us to, as he says here, the revealing of the sons of God, 
the, the resurrection, the kingdom of God, and so forth. Um, all of those imagery, all that imagery is sort of leading us to that final state of God um, coming down with the New Jerusalem and being with his people, and creation will be liberated at that point and to be what it was intended to be. And so as we look at hemagglutinin, and alligators and their ambush predation, grumpy bears murdering innocent hikers, um, these are signs of the groaning of creation. This is the groaning, right? And it's not, it's not a groaning that happened by accident. It's a groaning that happened because God subjected creation to this on account of the sin of human beings. And that once, now that sin has been defeated through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, once he returns to set up his kingdom and that final fulfillment takes place, then creation will be liberated from the suffering that it has. And I'm, I, for one, am really eager to find out what indeed, what these crocodiles are going to do, what rattlesnakes are going to be like. I, I want to know. I want to know how it all works yeah. out, because as a biologist, I'm, I'm utterly fascinated with it. And I find myself sometimes at a loss for words to even try to describe my feelings about it. Um, but I think this, this notion of subjection to futility is, mm. is the way to think about this, that, that, that all of these are birth pains and we're all together bringing forth the kingdom of God and it's coming. Be ready. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Be ready. Yeah. It's fascinating, isn't it? That the Bible connects the liberation of the created order with the redemption of humanity. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think Paul says in that passage, he sort of portrays creation as almost sort of straining on tiptoes as if it's somebody straining to look over the heads of the others in the crowd, waiting for this revelation yeah. of the sons of God, yeah. um, for, for its own liberation. So we have this biblical picture of a creation that was in some way subjected to this futility to this bondage to decay uh, that is now groaning. But this is not pain without purpose. This is the pain of childbirth where something is coming. You know, it's anticipating something glorious to come right. in the future, which is the redemption of the whole of humanity and the whole of creation. Um, yeah, that's been, that's been very helpful. So, uh, well, I feel like we've kind of skimmed over the surface, really, mm, because there's yeah. so much more that we could say on all of these things. But, you know, this is, this is, again, one of those series where we're going to be building, you know, in future episodes on things, themes that we've, we've touched on. And no doubt we will come back to the whole question of natural evil again in, in future episodes. Absolutely. But that's all that we've got time for um, this week. Uh, so uh, it's goodbye from us, and we'll see you in another fortnight's time. See you then. Thanks for watching. See you later. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Creation. For more information, visit us at letstalkcreation.org, where you'll find an archive of past episodes in all our show notes. If you'd like to leave a comment or make a suggestion, you can find us on all the major social media platforms. Let's Talk Creation is brought to you in the U.S. by Core Academy of Science and in the U.K. by Biblical Creation Trust. As a listener-supported ministry, we are grateful for all of your financial support. Find out how you can make a contribution at our website, letstalkcreation.org. Also remember to like, subscribe, and share this episode with your friends. Thanks, and see you next time.